Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Premji. I am the Assistant Director of Breast Cancer Research here at Sarah Cannon in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm really excited to be joined by Kevin Kalinske here at Onk Advancements. Thank you for being here, Kevin. Of course. I'm Kevin Kalinske. Uh, I direct the Division of Medical Oncology at Winship Cancer Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. Awesome. So today we're talking about ER-positive breast cancer, a whirlwind of data that's been coming out. We've got some burning questions over here, so would love to know your thoughts. In the setting of patients who are now receiving adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitors, who then unfortunately experience a relapse of disease that's metastatic, how are you then approaching CDK4-6 inhibitors, pig 3 ca mutated or otherwise? Mm -hmm. What is your approach? Is mm -hmm. it a treatment-free interval? Is it comorbidities? What kind of plays into your decision making? Yeah, I and mean, I do think that treatment-free interval is really important. I think that you know, we sometimes say, oh, like 12 months, is that our time period from when they had completed uh, said CDK4-6 inhibitor? There's nothing magical about that timeline. It just gives a sense of, you know, I, I would for sure be worried in a patient who's progressed, who's a tumor is progressing on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. 100%. I think it's important that for the patients who are progressing within a year of their adjuvant uh, endocrine therapy that were checking for pic 3 c mutations, also checking for ESRO mutations as well, but for the Anova 120 regimen and utilizing PI3K, uh, like you're using Anova the, the triplet regimen. And so I think like the, the burden of disease, because uh, it does just raise the question of how endocrine sensitive. Exactly. Um, and uh, we saw also in the control arm in Anova 120 that patients who just got double therapy did poorly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, great to hear that. In terms of what everyone's really talking about, geridestrin, the CERD, how do you incorporate this now into clinic? And how would you now, in the setting of having data on CDK4 inhibitors, having overall survival data with the bemaciclib, how do you incorporate all of this? Do you, would you consider a world of uh, AI plus CDK4-6 for the the limited duration time and then a switch strategy. Right. It, would you take a different approach in the absence of having data with a combination? Yeah, this is my take. This is my take. Yeah. Uh, one, you know, this was an interim analysis. We have about three years of follow up. It's nice to see this improvement with a hazard ratio of like, you know, high point sevens or so and uh, you know, and nearly three percent improvement in uh in base of disease to survival. I still feel like CDK4-6 inhibitors are important. You know, we're seeing an overall survival advantage uh, with abemocyclib, and there's this trend towards with decreased distant events with ribocyclib, including in those intermediate risk patients. And so I'm not abandoning that for those patients. Yeah. I think if you have a patient who really cannot tolerate a CDK4-6 inhibitor, you've tried, done everything you can, you just modified, you maybe switched to the other one, they just can't do it. Perhaps for those patients, it's a good question about once they're done, Maybe if I had a patient who was super high risk, you know, like six nodes involved, I'm just really worried and feel like I want to do everything, I would see if I could get it. It's not how the trial was designed. Exactly. There are other studies that are really looking at that. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't combine it with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, right? Uh, we'll wait for the results of Cambria 2, where there'll be some patients who have CDK4-6 inhibitors. And then for those patients who are lower risk, who wouldn't have been eligible for a CDK4-6 inhibitor, I think that... Um, they might be eligible, but I also think there's concerns of cost and things like that. Reasons to take into account. Cheap drugs. These are not cheap drugs. Is it really worth yeah. doing that? Yeah, exactly. No, great to hear. What would you like to see happen in the space of ER positive breast, hormone positive breast cancer? It's, it's rapidly evolving. There's so much coming out. There's many new targeted agents. In an ideal world, how does this all come together? Yeah. I mean, I think that in the metastatic setting, we have so many more selective drugs that are coming down the pike, you know, specific CDKs, uh, CDKs are, will be overcoming resistance. We have specific PI3K, specific AKT. Like, I think we're getting better in our targeted therapies. Um, and then I think those will move into the early stage setting, also with drugs that in targets that we couldn't, we didn't think patients could tolerate in the early stage setting. I think that will move over. But I do think, just to go back to the geridestrin data, yeah. I mean, it's remarkable that we haven't had new endocrine therapies for the last like, 20 years. Well, look how far we've come. That's right. I think that there will continue to be a pace of change. 
And then also moving away from chemotherapy. Oh, yeah. I feel like absolutely that would be great for us to be able to really move away. To be able to spare that from our patients is an incredible advancement. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. Cool.